Hello, I'm Phil Archer from GS1 Global Office. I've been here about four years now, and the previous eight years I was at W3C. So I've been around the world of URIs as identifiers, linked data, RDF, that kind of thing uh, for a number of years now. Which is why I was delighted to be invited to speak today. This is a, a real privilege. Thank you to Megan. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, the chance to talk about resolvers and linking identifiers to stuff. That's something that I get more excited about than is perhaps entirely uh, rational. GS1 uh, can claim, I think with some legitimacy, to have been involved in the concept of a digital twin in some form or another since the 26th of June 1974. It was at one minute past eight on that morning at a shop called Marsh Stores in the town of Troy in the state of Ohio, when Sharon Buchanan served Clyde Dawson a 10 pack of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Gum and the checkout went beep for the first time having scanned a barcode. It cost 69 cents. So that was the, that's sort of the, the date from which we say, okay, linking a physical thing to a computer, that's when we started doing it. But in fact, of course, for that to happen in a real store, there was some preparation for that and some thinking and some design. In fact, it all kicked off on the 31st of March, 1971, when a bunch of men, and I'm sorry, they were all men, got together in New York to talk about how they could get rid of the price sticker. If you're my age, you'll remember just about um, staff going around shops adding stickers to every single item on the supermarket shelf. How can we get rid of that? That was the motivation that led to the introduction of the barcode, uh, as I say, in uh, 1974. And think about the state of computing in those days. It was a very different world to what we have today. The state of the art was big mainframe computers with tape drives whirring around. This picture's from 1969. This is the kind of thing that was in the minds of those men when they were thinking about how to get rid of that price sticker. So it's no surprise and perfectly rational that what they came up with was you take an identifier, you put the identifier on a physical thing, and then you can look up, you can use that identifier to look up the item in that database. No problem, that works really well. In fact, it works extremely well, and it's still working very, very well today. There are billions of scans of barcodes every single day all over the world. Supply chains depend on it, retailers, manufacturers. It's that that barcode system, you only see the tip of the iceberg, right? There's a lot more behind the scenes that I won't bore you with. It doesn't matter today, but there's a whole system of identifiers and data standards that, that underpin a lot of the modern supply chains that we have in the world today. It's a very successful system. So when we came to start talking about what we now call GS1 Digital Link, there was a very clear instruction from on high. Don't mess this up. Don't, with your fancy internet this and your apps and your browsers, don't mess this up because it works. Okay, we're not gonna mess it up. And also don't assume that everybody is online. Don't tell me that to go beeper to check out, I've got to do an online lookup. That's not going to work. Barcodes do not make an online lookup every time you buy something at a store. It's got to work offline. Don't mess it up. Okay. That's not good enough for the modern world. The modern world is demanding of information. All of us know that we can answer any factual question just have to take out our phone and ask. We'll find out. So in the world of that GS1 cares about, that's what's this thing made of? Where did it come from? What's the carbon footprint? Where's the reviews? What else can I buy? What goes with this? All those questions. In the IoT world, who installed this? Who serviced it last? When's the battery gonna run out? All those kind of things you might ask a device, a sensor, you have different questions and you and I expect to be able to get an answer because if we can't get an answer, it's broken. Get another one. So how do we go from this mindset of big computer with everything you could possibly want to know, except that's never going to happen and looking up the item in that big database? Well, we could 
use the web. You could simply look up the item on Google, Bing, Yandex, Baidu, whatever your search engine of choice may be, and that will give you some information. A little bit flaky though, may or may not be what you want, but you'll get something. What you really want to do though is to take an identifier for that thing and stick it on the end of a URL. And if we do that, we can be quite sophisticated about it. Uh, if, if your interaction with our standards is purely something going people to check out, you're familiar with the one dimensional barcode that just has that one number in it. But as I say, there's a lot more to it. We have you know, batch numbers, serial numbers, expiry dates, locations, companies, assets, returnable assets. They all have different identifiers. And the history of the system, so I remind you, goes beep billions of times a day. It works very well, is each of those identifier types um, has a number. So 01 means this is uh, the one that goes beep at the checkout. 10 means it's a batch number. 21, that's a serial number. 17, that's an expiry date. And so on. And the GS1 Digital Link standard specifies in great detail how to put those identifiers into a string of characters. And what that means is that we've satisfied the ability to use it offline because you can take that string of characters it follows the syntax you can take out those identifiers and use them without any online lookup at all you've seen this before this is not new we didn't invent it dois are the best known example of this here is one doi on the end of three different resolvers so we're following in the footsteps of people who've gone long before us <laughs> Um, take an identifier, stick it on the end of a URL, a resolver, uh, and uh, see what you what you might get. So to recap, the fundamentals: an existing, successful, massively used identifier system, expressed within a URI, but you can extract the identifiers from the URI without an online lookup. But hang on, it's a URL, right? You can do some cool stuff with it. You can do so much with it because it's also online, right? You can link to different variants of color and size. You can link, you can find out if it's recalled. You can make sure that it meets your dietary needs or your, your own personal preferences to what you do and don't buy. Of course, it works in multiple languages. You want to buy it in Spanish? There it is. You want it in Chinese? There it is. All those things are possible. You can link to anything, right? You can, you can link to different sources, different data sources for humans, for machines. So many possibilities that we can do. For that to happen, okay, you need a resolver. You need something that's going to point the way from where you are to where you want to get to. And that's what our resolvers are designed to do. It's what all resolvers are, 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 are there to do. So let's take an example. We'll take a simple um, identifier and we're going to stick it on the end of the uh, domain name for the GS1 Global Office Resolver, id.gs1.org. And we put that in the web browser and no big surprise, we get a page describing that product. But I might have a specific question. If I'm confronted with um, a power tool in a hardware shop, I might want instructions for how to use it or show it me working. Or if I'm buying flat pack furniture, <clears throat> show me somebody putting it together. In the case of a food product, give me a recipe. Okay, let's try that. Let's try asking the resolver for a specific thing. We're gonna ask it for a, a recipe by specifying the value of the link type parameter. I'll come back to that in some detail, but we have a parameter called link type. Give me a recipe, same identifier, that hasn't changed. And hey, I get a recipe demos work, right? But maybe actually uh, what I really want is, to, I don't know, uh, just give me all the links. I don't know what you've got. Tell me all the links about this thing. So link type equals all, you get back a full set of links that the resolver knows about for this particular thing. Again, you've seen something like this with DOI resolvers, right? You don't just have that one redirect. There's other information that can come back from um, those different resolvers in the, in the uh, handle system. Now here we're looking at pages for humans, but it's also rather useful if it can work machine to machine. So if we ask for JSON, we'll get that link set back as JSON. 
and the particular format of the JSON here, this is actually being standardized at the IETF. It's very close to being completed. We're a big supporter of that. We want it to become an RFC as soon as possible. So standardized link sets, that is sets of links about uh, something that is identified using a GS1 identifier. Those link relation types, we just call them link types for short, but they're, they're link relation types. Um, we manage a list of them as part of our web vocabulary. You can manage your own. Link types can be you know, in any, any um, managed space. Um, so yes, they are link relation types, but they're also defined as RDF properties. And doing that means that the resolver is not just a service to enable you to find information you want or links to information you want. It's also a linked data node. Right? Because it's, it's, an, it's a URI, you've got RDF properties going off to different things that are themselves are identified by, by, by URIs. So the aim, and we don't have the data to do this, right? I'm sorry, we don't have a complete set of all data for everything with a barcode. Boy, I wish we did. We're working on it. We don't have it today. But the, the vision here is basically that anything with a barcode is on some sort of basic information graph that you can follow and get that information. We'll be adding full semantic interpretation of this to the resolver um, in future. It's, it's on the backlog to do, but it's not going to happen uh, straight away. So that's the vision. Make GS1 identifiers, uh, enable them to be a node on the linked open data graph. That's the, that's the hope. Before I finish, just one more thing that I, I, I would like to cover and take this opportunity to do so, because this is the perfect audience to, to, to bring this up. A question I might get, and actually last time I spoke to some folks working in DOIs, I did get, um, concerns URL sovereignty. You may have seen this document. This is Best Current Practice 190, written by Mark Nottingham. And it's all about the design of URI space and the sovereignty of servers. And what it basically says is don't do what GS1 Digital Link does. Don't take an identifier and stick it on the end of a URL and tell me that the domain name doesn't matter because the identifier is the important thing. That breaks the web. That's really bad to do that. And I'll give you an example of why. Let's go back to that DOI which identifies the paper that describes the discovery of the Higgs boson. If I look it up on doi.org, I get the paper describing the discovery of the Higgs boson. If I look it up on handle.net, I get the paper describing the discovery of the Higgs boson. If I look it up on my domain name, you get a picture of a cat. That's not wrong. I choose how I organize my URI space, you don't. I don't get to choose how you organize yours. Every server is sovereign. And if the URL itself looks a bit like a DOI or a GS1 digital link or an ISSN or whatever it may be, whatever identifier we're talking about, it may match the syntax, but don't assume that it is what you think it is. And don't assume you know what you're gonna get back. We have to mitigate about this. We have to mitigate against this somehow. And we have two major mitigations against the charge that we're breaking the web. The first one uh, is that we say explicitly that looking up the same identifier on different resolvers, you should not expect to get the same response. A classic example of that would be if I describe a product on a manufacturer's website, I'm going to get different information than if I look up the same item on a retailer's website. Um, again, a manufacturer of an IoT device might give you different information if you look up the, the maintenance record of that same thing. Right? So you, you should expect to get different information from different places. Ideally, it's about the same thing, but, you don't, but each, each resolver is sovereign unto itself. And the second thing, that we do to mitigate against the charge that we're breaking the web is that if you are operating a GS1 conformant resolver, then one of the tests is that there is a resolver description file in the well-known location. So dot well-known is a part of URI space that is reserved by the IETF in a document written by Mark Nottingham. Um, so dot well-known slash GS1 resolver. If you find a resolver description file there, okay, 
it's a resolver. You can start doing things like asking link type questions and, and so on. And having gone through that process, I'm very pleased that Mark Nottingham was happy and said, yep, that's okay. You're not breaking best current practice anymore. So there's more information. Of course, there's the standard and related information on the GS1 website. There's a nine minute YouTube video uh, where I go through more detail of what GS1 Digital Link is. And there's a load of open source code in GitHub, most of which written by my colleague, Nick Lansley, who is also the video producer today. Thank you, Nick. Here's how to get hold of me. Thanks.